okay it should be fine great thank you well welcome everyone and um just very excited to be here for this inaugural meeting of our climate and environment scrutiny panel um and we've got lots to get through um so first of all we've had an apology from councillor dunn um and now secondly we need to um, just find out if there are any declarations of interest from anyone here tonight. Um, no hands. Um, so this is then just a reminder that uh, the meeting is being live streamed and to um, ask that all microphones are turned off um, unless you've been asked to speak. Um, so are we now okay to, to hear our um, hear from our speaker Dr Meryl Gelling is, is she ready to talk to us um, I can't see her in here but I've got a hand up so I'll allow Evelyn to speak and see if she can hello can you hear me yes we can hear you hello um I thought Meryl was going to come and give her statement but I could give it on her behalf I'm happy for that it, what what do others think what what Alice yeah, there's no problem with that if you're happy, Chair. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Thank you, Evelyn. OK, shall I go ahead? Yes, this is the um, th this is what we've already been sent, isn't it, through from it Dr. Yes. yes, thank you. So to introduce Dr. Meryl Galling, she's lived in Oxford for over 20 years, um, having first moved here to complete a DPhil in zoology at Oxford University. And she now works as an independent project species ecologist and over recent years has increasingly sought to bridge the gap between research and practical application. Um, so this is what she said. It is a pleasure to be addressing the new climate and environment panel at this inaugural meeting. The creation of this panel demonstrates the commitment of Oxford City Council to follow through on their declaration of ecological emergency in October 2022. Councillors on this panel understand that we are currently in the midst of a biodiversity emergency something that is far too often seen as a global issue rather than a crisis on our very own doorsteps. This crisis in biodiversity is for many people much less tangible than the climate crisis. Biodiversity is often seen as something to be sidelined or mitigated, but the relentless degradation of nature through land conversion, felling of mature trees, extraction of resources, habitat fragmentation and pollution has reached a critical point point where we can no longer take for granted the basics of our life support systems, clean air, water and food, or the integrity of the complex web of life of which we are a part and which is so essential to our well-being. The UK is often perceived as a green and pleasant land. In fact, it is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. More than one in seven of our native species are facing extinction and a further 40% are in serious decline. This is, this is a result of centuries of farming, building and industrialization, and the lack of any cohesive joined up plan across the country. OCC's vision for their biodiversity strategy and action plan is a timely opportunity to, re to redress the balance, to identify the key threats to habitat and biodiversity in Oxford, and to find out how we can best protect, connect and enhance biodiversity, working collaboratively with the abundant expertise that exists at every level in the city. There are a number of areas that I would like to highlight in the biodiversity strategy proposal to ensure it fulfills the desired potential. The first is the makeup and remit of the steering group, which will be key. Particularly important will be to include members of the community, local ecologists, wildlife groups, and species experts who have direct knowledge and experience of what is already happening on the ground. The university's biodiversity network and the Healthy Ecosystem Restoration in Oxfordshire, or HERO project, already have an active network of nature recovery groups. HERO aims to build a community of practice between the university and local practitioners, and will also form a resource for the university and its constituent colleges within broader sustainability goals. Close partnership working with them between town and gown will ensure that there is no repetition of effort and create a result that will be so much more than the sum of its constituent parts. Part of the remit of the steering group should be to challenge the existing attitudes and behaviours towards nature. 
Instead of being seen as a problem to be overcome or offset, biological diversity should be valued for the enormous benefits it brings, reducing air and water pollution, crop pollination, climate change resilience through carbon capture, drought and flood protection, and urban cooling. And then there is the value biodiversity brings to health, education, and well-being. Plymouth City Council created a vision in 2019 to put nature at the heart of their decision making, to inspire a new wave of citywide investment in nature-based solutions and research this innovative approach. The Nature-Based Solutions Initiative originates in our very own University of Oxford and sets out our inspirational ways for collaborative working that could be hugely successful here. Now is the time to embrace such an approach and build it into Oxford's strategy. Points eight and nine recognise that undertaking a baseline exercise is a vital first step against which to measure improvement over time. Numerous organisations and data sources are identified, but it will be vital to afford due consideration as to how that information will translate into an ac accurate baseline data and maps. The Council's designated sites in point 13 provide a backdrop to identify land owned by other organisations and individuals to invite into the fold, creating a network and mosaic of bigger, better and more joined up sites across the city. This will improve access to nature for all residents, create a unique opportunity to provide additional sites for nature-based education across the city, while still allowing enough space for nature to flourish. The 2040 Local Plan for Oxford is currently open for public consultation. It plans for a 27% increase in Oxford population by 2040 and the creation of over 15,000 new jobs. Water, air and light pollution, groundwater destruction, habitat fragmentation, all destroy biodiversity. Increasing numbers of people would put even more pressure on a reducing number of green spaces and diminish biodiversity further. To prevent such harms, it will be vital that the Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan is integral to the formulation of the 2040 Local Plan. Reliance should not be made on displacing nature in calculations of biodiversity net gain. Instead, the focus should be on preserving and enhancing the habitats Oxford already has and increasing the priority given to nature in its own right. So in summary, I very much hope and expect that the creation of this panel suggests a new resolve to look at how all decisions in the city of Oxford are made in terms of their ecological and climactic potential. I look forward to hearing that this group will be meeting frequently and that and will be central to all aspects of policy making. Oxford enjoys hosts of sites which are vitally important for wildlife. Together they provide a wealth of benefits to the city's residents and visitors. Implementation of a robust and forward-thinking, collaborative and innovative biodiversity strategy will ensure our world-famous dreaming spires become world-leading in how it integrates natural ecological variety as essential to the future of our city. There are three recommendations. If there's time, I will read them. The first one is that the steering group for the biodiversity strategy should include Oxford University's biodiversity network and hero project, along with community wildlife groups and local ecologists. Second, that the steering group should learn from best practice in other cities, such as the Plymouth Green Mines project. And thirdly, that biodiversity implications should be given equal weight across decision making, particularly around the 2040 local plan, as adding immense value for the future of the city. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I couldn't really think of a better way to um, start tonight's meeting and also um, setting up and, and, and starting off um, this this um panel i think it's a an expression really of why we've all um decided we have to drive this issue and um i also just wanted to thank all the councillors who've very much been behind um putting this together um i think actually um we're, we're now going to move things around um so that rose can leave um sooner rather than later and um start actually with um the sixth um agenda point which is the net zero master plan um which i believe um 
Councillor Railton is going to um, present to us. Uh, thank you very much, Jemima. So, um, uh, yeah, so the Net Zero Master Plan um, outlines actions over the next two years to achieve both targets of a Net Zero Council uh, by 2030 and a net citywide Net Zero target by 2040. Um, there's also an outline of completed actions for the past two years as well, um, without sort of picking through. And uh, I don't know, is, do any of the officers present want to pick out anything in particular? Because there's very much a list of actions, which I didn't really want to, you know, read out. Um, so, yeah, if anybody would like to add something at this point. Potentially Rose, yes. <laughs> I can just try add a bit of context to sort of why we developed the plan and, and what it is. Um, so the, the master plan was compiled by the Environment Sustainability um, team, and it was developed um, in response to the BDO environmental audit um, from July last year. Um, and it aims to capture all cross council actions that, as has been mentioned, sort of sit at, um, beneath the 2030 and the 2040 um, net zero goals over the, over the next two years. Um, and I think it should also be read alongside um, documents like the Carbon Management Plan and the Zero Carbon Oxford Roadmap and Action Plan, which provide a longer term view. Um, and the purpose of the plan is to better enable um, all of us to track progress against those two targets, is to help identify any resourcing issues of, um, and also to support things like prioritization just so we have everything um, all in one place. It is alive and it's a working do document um, and it's gonna constantly change for that reason. Um, and it will be updated um, every quarter in advance of the Net Zero Steering Group, which meets chairs and in advance of this meeting. Um, so I think, you know, we it's a step. This this document is a step towards what we what is needed for, for that purpose. But I think more work, and we recognise that more work is needed to sort of further improve what we've got here. Um, and, and in particular, sort of the, the it, we know that we need to kind of better capture financial information, so information about funding and so on. I think it'd be good to sort of more comprehensively log completed actions. Perhaps include some greenhouse gas reporting where we have it. Um, Possibly things like clearer deadlines and action owners, and you know more clarity about when actions are done as well. Um, so I think there's you know there's a explainer at the top of the document about how to read it, but I think the main thing is it's split into the 2030 and the 2040 target, um, and there's also an indication for each action about where that's been agreed, where where that some of them have kind of evolved, but so um, so for example like leaders meetings or the carbon management plans, so you can see where those actions relate back to. Um, I think you know it, it is a cross council plan so environment state sustainability team are responsible for some but not all of these actions so i suppose we can do our best to answer questions about the actions but we might also need to bring colleagues from across the council and at future meetings to to answer more detailed questions i suppose it would in particular be really helpful to know how we can prove this document and you know in addition to what's been said around to make sure it sort of serves the purpose that you need in this group around sort of tracking progress thank you Thank you, Rose. I mean, it seems to me an extraordinarily comprehensive document and um, very impressed by the detail and also the sense of, um, you know, urgency if you're talking about having put this together since last July. Um, I mean, I had one question, but I don't know if other people want to jump in and um, if there are points people want to raise, perhaps put your hands up. I mean, something that just certainly stood out for me was um, the issue of water. and um, number eight it's energy and water procurement but i was just wondering where we are really with wording around um despite the fact that it's rained now for two weeks um the issue is that water is running out that we know we have not built any reservoirs for 30 years <clears throat> that we're going to be facing along with everything else a huge water shortage a water crisis and i know obviously it's not the remit of the council to start building reservoirs but I just was wondering about um, the need to really highlight um, how this is well a it's part of net zero clearly um, we need water for, for everything and also um, that we need to really be focusing on this now um, as a as a matter of urgency sorry I keep turning myself off yes um, Rose did you want to respond 
I mean, my or Mish might want to come in, but I think one thing that springs to mind is the work that we're doing. Um, well, Zero Carbon Oxide Partnership have identified that we need to work on adaptation um, yeah. sort of as a matter of urgency. So we've got that on the on the forward plan. And as a sort of first step, what we're doing, the first year in group meeting of this is next week, I believe, um, on this county-wide base signing exercise to understand what the kind of, what to understand the, yeah, the situation county-wide on adaptation, which will include, I think, some of the issues that you've, you've highlighted there. Um, right. As part of our carbon management plan, we have actions to sort of minimise our own water usage. Um, but yeah, I think it's not drawn out in this document enough. So I think we should take that and make sure that that's included. Thank you. <clears throat> Emily, did you have a point? Yes, I have a couple of points. Um, firstly, I, I echo Jemima's words. I think it's great. It's really comprehensive. Um, and, you know, I've seen this done in corporates and I think it's pretty impressive to get to this level of detail. So, you know, firstly, congratulations to everyone. Um, I have a couple of uh, minor kind of points of, of not exactly formatting, but just how it's framed. Um, it will be very useful to understand how important each of the actions is, you know, in terms of delivering towards net zero, because obviously some of them are really important. Uh, like waste, for example, uh, but it may not contribute as much as energy. And just reflecting back on what Nick Hare said in our initial kickoff, you know, really, it's all about energy and cars. Um, those are the, like, the two huge buckets that we can affect. So some might be a colour or like either is it one, two, three, you know, is it large, small or whatever, medium size? That would just help you know, frame us potentially, um, you know, it, obviously an indicative carbon saving would also be really useful, but I realize you guys are calculating that at the moment. So, you know, if we can have numbers, great. If not, maybe just a kind of high, medium, low would be useful. It would also potentially be good to kind of, um, maybe just categorize them at an even higher level than the action area. I don't know if we've done that, if there's sort of five different buckets. And again, just coming back to how Nick framed it, you know, it kind of was in, energy transport he had four buckets i think i don't know if there's a higher level uh framing than the action areas just because it, it would be easier to read having said that you guys are familiar with all the detail maybe maybe not not really that bothered uh just a suggestion there um and yes i might again if if we can see high medium low it would be useful to have them arranged in order of importance so we have really the important ones at the top because i think it can be tempting with a, a, a list like this to split equal time and we'll probably find that three of the actions are going to deliver 80% of the value. Uh, and we really need to kind of be able to focus our time accordingly on those th three actions or, you know, however many it is, but just, yeah, sort of the same, the, making the same point. Uh, then just in terms of content and nobody that knows me will be surprised to hear me say this. Um, I observed that scope three emissions from transport are only in the net zero city by 2040. So I can see that we've got, um, you know, scope three, basically transport is in uh, business business travel. So that's coming into net zero by 2030. But I, I suppose my question is, uh, if we want to hit net zero by 2040, and if we don't have clear plans for decarbonizing, you know, within the city, um, like, does this mean that if we, I don't know, want to build a new off route road cycle track, we won't be able to because it's not a priority in here. Um, and there may be very good reasons behind this, but I would just uh, I just question some of the actions that we should take if they're not applying till 2040. Uh, we could find that, you know, we're not able to do them or we're not able to commit resource to doing them simply because a lot of that's been pushed back um, to 2040. Now, there may be other reasons uh, why that has happened. But um, yeah, can I just highlight the wider transport point missing from 2030? Um, but overall, it looks great. Thank you. Hi, Mish, did you want to come back on, on that? Thank you. Yeah, yes, thank you, um, Chair. Just, uh, I guess on that point, I, I think that, I mean, I'd, I'd just um, reiterate uh, a point Rose made about this being a living document. So it is effectively, it's a sort of snapshot in time, what you're looking at. This is what, what I wouldn't wish you to think is that this is our plan to get to net zero all the way to 2040. It ain't that. It, 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 what you're seeing are live things that we're actually working on at the moment of the council so I, I i mean absolutely accept the point that we we must forget there are other things that need to be done um that, that you know we, we need to get around to in, to ensure that we're doing those and i think that the the, the the sort of carbon management plan for the council itself as well as of course the 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 carbon roadmap that uh, we've we've now got sort of commissioned and agreed uh, within zedcop that sort of tracks the the pathway to to net zero for a city as a whole that's probably 
tells the clearer picture of, of that sort of full range of things that we'll need doing, but uh, uh, that you're not seeing everything in here, I, I accept that. Great, thank you, that's clear. Thank you. <clears throat> Catherine, did, uh, Councillor Mars, did you have a, something to raise? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I understand that you've distinguished between the level of funding that exists at the moment for different activities. And what would be, I think, quite useful um, is to understand and see, it's, you won't be able to share it all now, but what the potential and specific plans are for, for um, alternative finance um, sources for, for some of the unfunded things. You know, where what, what, what sources do you go to? Is it just government grants or are you looking at other funding sources? Because I, uh, I do understand that there's you know, innovative financing out there that you, know, you could be um, applying for, tapping into in some, uh, some way or grants from other sources. Um, so if that information was made available and, and there was some sort of tracking on that, that could be um, be useful. Um, the, the second point that I just wanted to raise with electric vehicles, the focus seems to be EVs in terms of you know, cars and vans and that site sort of vehicles. But we know that um, when you start talking about last mile delivery, you're starting to get a larger range of what you know, we see the, the electric cargo bikes that are coming around in Oxford, but actually they are on the market in other European countries, essentially like much larger versions of, of these, not quite um, what we would call an electric vehicle um, in the ODS is driving around, but yeah, is there scope for um, some of the focus around that to um, go into these sort of bike based electric um, uh, yeah, vehicles rather than um, the, the ones that you focus on at the moment? Yeah, I, I think those are good points. And they also come up, don't they, in the, um, the next strategy plan that we're looking at um, in terms of the, the greening of the last mile. Um, I don't know if perhaps we want to reserve that for looking at um, Zero Carbon Oxford Partnership plan or whether Anna, you'd like you have anything to, to comment on now uh well this yes it is very much one of the zcob sprints so i don't know how it fits into this master plan not uh, yeah this update of the master plan I mean, I think what's interesting is this overlap now, because it seems to me the more overlap, the better, and actually, you know, trying to ensure nothing falls through the cracks. I mean, for me, in terms of biodiversity, it's very reassuring to see that uh, number 42, you're bringing it up the, 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 the issue of our meadows, which I think we'll come on to later, but it's crucial that these aren't forgotten and they're not tacked on as a side show to what we're trying to do here in terms of our holistic, now vision for zero carbon in, in, in Oxford. Um, were there any other um, questions we had? Otherwise, thank you, Mish, yeah. Just, I, I guess, just picking up the point on cargo bikes. So actually you'll see right at the bottom of the document where we, um, we highlight some of the things that we've already delivered. Um, one of those is section three was the e-cargo bike uh, pilot in the covered market, which is, um, I believe, still running. Uh, I'm looking at my, yeah, she's nodding. And, uh, and which actually serves a, a, a kind of a really useful case study and exercise uh, in an enabling uh, retailers to, to actually get their hands on this stuff, uh, try it out. And because we're doing it, uh, we're paying pedal and post, we've had funding to, to enable them to, to actually sort of help deliver this pilot. It's um, uh, it, it's also kind of bound within uh, the reality of, a, of an existing actual commercial operation. So I think, uh, you know, I think that actually uh, in this, in that, that, which is why you're seeing it in the kind of already done bit, the scaling up bit, which I, th I, I guess is what you're really asking is, yes, that's that's a big old uh, uh, project. And, and ZCOP, as, uh, as has already been mentioned, is, is where uh, discussions are, are taking place on that. Um, Emily, yes. Just a very quick one on EVs. Um, 
Uh, I see that we but essentially are we doing anything with car parks and EVs? I know you're drafting and approving the implementation plan for the EV strategy. So apologies if there's a live document that I've missed. Um, but are, are city car parks included in that? Does anyone know? And if not, who do I ask? Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, that, that they that they will be. Um, uh, we, we, we obviously, as, as as you're aware, we already do have some EV charging in city car parks. You'd expect to see that there will be more. Uh, absolutely. Great. Thank you. Great. Catherine, was there something you wanted to raise? Otherwise, I think we'll move on to. Yeah, it's very yeah. briefly. So I understood from um, the the point that you're working with HMOs, um, the rented sector on energy targets. Um, and to uh, address the, so the EPC rating. But what was a bit unclear um, was around uh, council-owned commercial buildings um, so on, um, yeah, the end, where the, on page 11, 11 uh, and 24, um, uh, respectively, whether this, um, the, the work that you were doing there was also going to be looking at um, uh, improving the EPC ratings of the, uh, commercial buildings that uh, we as a city council own. Thank you. Can anyone pick up on that? Uh, Mish, yeah. I, I'm happy to. I was, I was waiting for Rose to jump in there. So, okay, no, that's, yeah, that's over fine. To you. So, um, the, the uh, commercial buildings is absolutely something that we're looking at. We don't have a, a scoped project uh, around that yet. Uh, it is something which uh, Malcolm Peake, um, who is the uh, overall property manager um, for these sorts of uh, uh, projects, is 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 commissioning a scoping exercise. So once we actually have a, a program that can describe how we might go about doing work on this, you'd expect to see it uh, then come into this document. At the moment, it's uh, in a sense, it's it, it's 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 no more than something which has been discussed and identified as a need, but without a plan yet. Great, thank you. Well, um, at this point, I'm thinking we'll move on to um, the ZCOP um, strategy strategy document, if everyone's happy with that. Um, and once again, I mean, extraordinary to actually see the work that's going on and also um, just what one always hopes is happening here in Oxford. This amazing, um, you know, range of stakeholders and how you've brought them all together and what you're doing um, it, with this roadmap um, is astonishing. Um, so in terms of um, questions then, I'm going to open up and see if any other councillors want to um, raise points or make comments. Uh, Catherine. Yeah, so um, just in terms of the partnership, is there scope to in include additional organisations in um, or sectors within um, this? Because um, only today I was speaking to um, one of the private schools in North Oxford and, and transportation related uh, emissions um, and the work that they're doing um, on that is yeah, uh, something that has been noted by, by the council as an issue and something we need to as a city work on. So I wonder whether you know, we could um, engage somehow with the independent school sector um, or educational sector in the city, because actually as a contributor to the economy, I think it does contribute um, a significant door. amount. Um, so um, maybe each individual school doesn't, but when you put them in aggregate terms, so just wondering whether that would be feasible. Um, I think that's a good point to raise. I, I, I mean, I know just as a comment that they do all work independently, but certainly they are coming together now over transport. So that does seem to me something we could flag up and um, we've all, including Emily, been working with the different schools. So that's a very good point. Um, Emily. Um, I just wondered if there were, uh, and it may be in a different document, um, kind of timelines of when this will be communicated out, either to councillors or wider. Um, and kind of, I, I think, Rose, you kind of hinted at this, that perhaps this document would 
have more timelines in it kind of in another iteration um, but again it's just when you see this there's loads of brilliant stuff going on um but i always like to know when the next milestone is or you know when it's when the the, the deadline is at the end uh, to or when to communicate out or kind of what the benchmarks are and, and i guess the question there would, would be about the frequency of the zcop meetings are they quarterly or are they kind of monthly um and just when uh, is there a way that we can be kind of kept appraised of of the live actions that are taking being taken Hopefully that makes sense. It was three questions in one. Yeah, I think very important to know that. Um, and Rose, yes, thank you. I mean, I was just, we could provide updates. I mean, because we provide updates to the, the ZECOP steering group on um, a quarterly basis. So we could provide updates to this group just, you know, because we've got, the, we're tracking the actions so we can, we can bring that here if that's, if that, if, if you find that useful. I think that'd be extremely useful and also, um, you know, is establishing us now um, as also one of the committees to be um, engaging with. So I think that would be great. Thank you. Um, but there are other points to raise. I think, yeah, Catherine, as you last um, brought up the greening, the last mile delivery is here. And I just, I mean, one's heard from um, other councillors that there have been conversations certainly prior to uh, my time of two years with Amazon, for example, who were going to set up a pilot scheme here in Oxford. Has that happened? I mean, you know, why has it not happened? Perhaps um, we've got vans um, parking everywhere, as we know. Um, also, it seems to me the supermarkets, which we've now start, have started doing this a bit, um, they'd be great to get behind this. Anyway, just what, what level of detail and who's, who's engaging on this? Um, Anna. Uh, thanks. Yes, I was just wondering if we could resolve the question about ZCOP uh membership and how people get added or not <laughs> so i just so there's the steering members can be added to the steering group with agreement from other steering group members um so i think we would just need to take um the suggestion to the next steering group meeting and i'd ask that and make, and, yeah and make a recommendation that you know x organizations are added added to the to the ZCOP that could either be on the steering group or it could be um just as a, a general member um so yeah I think that's that's how we could we could do that okay I think that makes sense doesn't it um and also great to know that this is now actually a forum that other people can um stakeholders can, can join and um we can really make sure that, that every everyone everything is covered um, um Something I always mention are trees, whether we can just actually have a mention of trees um, when we talk about climate resilience through the natural environment. I just think that's, that's something I'm going to come up come on to in bio, biodiversity. Um, but that's just a small point that um, I think is important. Uh, Mish. Thank you. Yes, um, I just just in terms of the way ZCOP operates, I, thought, I think whilst um, <coughs> City Council currently holds the chair with uh, Council Leader in, in that position, it is very much a, a, a kind of an equal partnership of, of members. And so the uh, essentially it, it's the agenda of issues which it seeks to tackle are, are issues which have been highlighted by uh, those members that they, they want to see addressed. And actually the some of the work streams are, or indeed many of the work streams are led by uh, organisations other than the council, other than the city council. So um, freight consolidation and to your sort of query about Amazon and so forth, it, it, it is actually, it's county that's leading uh, work in this space. Now we're, we're, we're plugged into that as indeed are other uh, organisations uh, on said couple universities particularly interested in the, the freight consolidation work uh, as you might anticipate. Um, and the way it also works is that there are organisations which aren't sort of formally within the ZCOP steering group of approximately 20 organisations that can be involved in some of the individual, um, you know, sprint groups or task and finish groups or whatever you want to call them, but, but, but focused pieces of work where clearly uh, with freight consolidation, the likes of Amazon, um, DPD indeed, and others that are very interested in, in you know, uh, delivery uh, 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 arrangements into the city uh, you'd want to see involved. Thank you. I mean, is there any organisation that represents retail in Oxford that has a voice that can contribute um, to this and also this incredible proliferation of hotels 
that uh, keeps springing up as we lose retail um, and trying to engage them, I think, is crucial as hopefully we move towards pedestrianising central Oxford um, and actually bringing them on board, you know, with sort of branded, you know, e cargo bikes and so on. Um, we don't have any um, hotels. We do have Landsec, though, um, or better known as Westgate locally, oh, yeah, <coughs> which yeah. is which is clearly by some significant margin our largest retailer. If you right, the, right. Uh, the, the the space they they uh, consume. Yeah. Okay, um, Catherine. Yeah, and I think to um, to the membership point, um, some of the business to business. Uh, um, employers um, um, in, within the city might be um, worth looking at to, to your point on hotels we we'll often see the catering lorries um, which serve as also some of the the schools as well as um, the uh, the hotels um, and yeah, they um, will continue to be part of the economy and maybe they're um, some uh, type of organization to to prioritize um, my second point um, is really a, a question if we're able to yeah as uh, the city council being a member of this yeah put um, topics on the agenda and something that seems to be missing but it has been brought to council recently and will be again at the the next council meeting is this idea of solar canopies on um, car parks and just wondering whether that's something that um, through this forum can be put on the agenda as one of the sprint group topics or something to explore further thank you thank you Catherine I think that's a very good point and actually um has been part of a conversation about these huge solar farms that are planned for outside of Oxford and whether actually that's the right route to be taking when we could be just as in France and other European countries now um adding them to the tops of every available building in in our high density cities um uh Rose yeah, I was just going to say that on the, the sprint group that's looking at renewables, that's taken, there's been a few parts of that, but one part of it is that the partners want to look at, in particular, where we've got land assets that are adjacent and we can do some collaborative work there, which I think could capture some of what's just been suggested. Um, yeah. That's great. That's, yeah, brilliant to know that. Um, Anna. Um, I will just roll out the stat because I quite like it. So total like solar capacity of all of the roofs in Oxford if you put solar panels on every single appropriate roof is about 30 megawatts um, and Botley West is 840 megawatts so like these are quite different scales um, I just like to sort of emphasize that we have to do things at scale um, and I think this is what ZEGCOP is about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think that's very illuminating so yeah no well that is something we have to take on board um, as well as land use and so on. Um, just, um, I was interested in the feasibility studies that, you know, who actually um, gets to look at feasibility studies once they're um, drawn up? Is that something that's shared? Um, are those, you know, that they're working documents, do, do we, do, you know, do we get to see them? That's my question. I suppose the ones, I think it, probably would depend on a case by case basis, but for the, the feasibility that's being, that has been done so far, that was the engagement um, work in Rose Hill that we did with Project Leo, and that's been shared with Project Leo partners, um, ZEDCOP and councillors. Um, the next stage is, um, well, the next feasibility that's happening is the Pathfinder Places, formerly Pioneer Places project that runs from April um, to June. So that's a, a larger scale feasibility in terms of the partnership and the funding behind it. Um, I think, so that will be, as part, the app findings from that will be um, put into a final report that will go back to UK Innovate and some of that will be therefore be in the public domain. Um, and then the next, the next feasibility that will follow on from that is um, a is kind of doing a more detailed look at the costs of doing a, re a retrofit scale um, in a particular locality and I think um, I don't see why that couldn't be um, made you know available um, I think we need to discuss with the, with the partners that are involved as we work that up but I think generally it's you know available to sector partners and um, more widely. Thank you I mean that's just good to know as a um going forward if, if that's something that you know we can uh, be aware of I think. Um, were there any other points um, councillors wanted to raise um, 
about the ZCOP document. Um, um, I mean, just out of curiosity, green leases, I actually had to look up. I was just wondering about the detail on those and whether that's something that um, is implemented, whether they are now um, used um, across the board in terms of how you're um, managing buildings, um, whether through retrofitting or, um, you know, is, is this greenwash or, or is there detail here that's, that's really interesting and going to improve things? I think that's definitely an area where we need to do some more work to understand what's possible. Um, yeah, and I think it, it you know, it, I think it, you know, it could unlock um, decarbonisation in sort of commercial buildings, and we want to work with sort of other large uh, commercial landlords in the city to to see what's possible. But it's, it's work that we want to do, so I can't really answer too fully at the moment um, in terms of what the potential is. Thanks. Yeah. Well, look forward to those, um, Catherine. Yeah, it's, it's sort of a cross-cutting point. I mentioned it with the uh, previous agenda item, but it's this question of funding and how you identify funding for this, where you know additional funding is needed um, and, and what the process is, because um, uh, that seems to be also a bit of the constraint in being able to deliver some of what you um, want to. So, so we host the Secretariat um, for the Zero Carbon Oxford Partnership, and uh, our, the, the officer who leads on that has been um, looking basically just looking on a regular basis for funding opportunities but prioritizing prioritizing kind of um you know buildings that's why we focus so much on retrofit just obviously because it's such a big area that we need to work on so that's why we kind of um that's why the kind of feasibility work that we've got funding for is focused there um but yeah she's looking across the board and trying to share with their partners as the as, as things come up as relevant to the the action plans it's, it's kind of an ongoing thing but resource is definitely going into making sure we're spotting and applying for uh, funding where it's relevant. And just as a uh, follow up, it, just in terms of the categorization of the funding, is it is it central government funding? Are you looking at other sources of grants as well? Other sources as well. Um, and then, you know, in some cases we need to work with um, other organisations to be able to apply for that but um, you know there's you know there's funding from sort of charitable organisations and um, the end the funding that we've got for the next feasibility is from the M MCS foundation and um, the micro generation certification scheme foundation so they're, 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 they're the arm the foundation that um, charitable arm of that organisation so I suppose yeah that's an example of where it's not just um, government funding that we're looking at. Great. Well, thank you. Um, were there any other points? Otherwise, I think we will go on to the next um, agenda item, uh, number eight, which is the fleet carbonisation um, plan and the paper, um, which, um, yeah, again, hugely comprehensive, but also um, alerting us to the fact that there are challenges um, with decarbonisation and obviously this huge problem with um, electricity, um, well, the fact that we have the most expensive electricity in the world, the UK does, so that cannot be helpful. Um, any points? Um, Emily, did you have anything that you wanted to raise um, on this? Sorry, I do. I just lost the, you know, I lost the screen. Um, uh, so, yeah, so this is great. Again, thank you. Uh, and it's clear about the, the the charges, you know, making it more expensive. Uh, in the conclusion section, so number 22, um, totally understand the limited availability of EVs to meet needs. Uh, but I wonder, and therefore the impossibility of having a target, but it does say it wouldn't make sense to set out an interim fleet EV target, whereas it strikes me that it might be possible to have a target for some of the fleet. Uh, in other words, not the HGVs, etc., because it makes the point um, in, I think it's point 17, uh, it basically says above, we are continuing to buy EVs uh, for the cars that we can. So presumably we could have a stab in the dark at what, what the cars that we can are, which are probably the vans and the cars, uh, and the cars that we can't, which are probably the bin lorries, um, and therefore potentially have some kind of target set around the, I don't know, 40% of cars that we can do something about, or the 80% or whatever it is. Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm just challenging that conclusion in 22 that it is impossible to have a target. I think having a target, even if it's a range of targets, is much better than having no target. So even if it's we will change between another 
20 to 40 percent you know that's a massive range that's a, like a hundred percent range in there it would be better than just saying we'll carry on doing what we think uh we can so i don't know if anyone wants to respond to the feasibility of a sub target for a subcategory of the vehicles thank you yeah uh, okay yes and i'm happy to pick that up i think that's a fair challenge um i have had lengthy discussions with colleagues over at ods who uh, around all of this uh in terms of uh, and in terms of sort of trying to get a, a sense of what what are the what's the priority here so initially i think that the 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 sense was that the most important thing was to was to meet uh, effectively the, the uh, almost like the associated carbon targets uh, that that you would associate with fleet hence uh, a, a sort of proposal was looked at uh, around hvo as a as a stepping stone because it, it it could take you there if you believe in all of that but actually it, you know as soon as we started asking some sort of searching questions on this and with very clear steer from the scientific advisor uh we, we you know we, we really rejected that uh outright so instead you're you're then you're looking at trying to get a level of confidence that we will continue in the right direction towards uh, that sort of that that uh, overall net zero fleet by 2030, which we still think is 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 the right target. Um, so I, I'll I'll take that away, and, and we'll have a further look as you, as you've suggested at whether or not we can produce a target which looks at part of the fleet, uh, i.e. the kind of the, the light goods vehicle, yeah, yeah exactly. side of it. Um, we'll see if that's feasible. Notwithstanding. Um, you, you will also have read in the paper that we do have some capacity issues now around our actual EV charging infrastructure, which also will need to be addressed, um, uh, albeit that's a, sort of a, a broader issue that we want to pick up anyway, uh, going back to the sort of the points that were made earlier about uh, uh, freight consolidation and EV commercial fleets in the city anyway. I mean, out of interest, are we, I lost track of this, but are we still on board, on track um, to with the purchase of the hydrogen powered buses? Um, is, is that still happening? And then do we become a sort of model city um, in terms of um, pioneering this? Or are there other cities that we can be looking at to just out of interest? Uh, electric buses, yes. Or electric buses, right, right. Yeah, that, that, that's the Zebra um, programme, which... Uh, 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 which has been confirmed. So, uh, purchase of those buses um, that's uh, that's funded through government and uh, um, and through the uh, uh, the bus company, Oxford Bus Company itself, and, 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 a, and a contribution by the county council. But that's that's on track, which should give us then a full electric bus fleet in the city. That's that's great. And um, is that 2024? Then is that is there a date for that? Isn't I'm it? Ask my to help me out here. I think it's the end of this year. Oh, great! They will be appearing. Okay, everything. Oh no. Okay. The, okay. No, that's a lie. The oh. press release says March twenty twenty four. Okay. Right. Good to know. Thanks, uh, Catherine. Yeah. So, um, with ODS, many of the journeys are within the ring road, and I understand there's certain journeys that need to be made in larger vehicles, and and that's unavoidable. But um, every time I've asked about the use of e-cargo bikes, and I'm thinking not just the type that pedal and paste use at the covered market, but much larger versions of these um, that are e-bikes, um, whether we really should be looking at um, this, the fleet decarbonisation and, and use of these new types of electric bikes, which are much larger for you know, freight, not for um, people or you know, small children, um, because there are so much, uh, so many of the journeys in the ring road where these would work. And uh, you know, given that we've got the challenges facing uh, um, the uh, the car and van versions of you know e vehicles, whether actually setting a target or looking at uh, proactively seeing what part of the fleet could be moved onto these larger e bikes, I think is something that um, might help us with the decarbonisation potentially. So yeah. Do you think that this is a runner or are we going to you know, just have the the statement again from ODS, which you know, companies panel, they've also you know, said a number of times, sorry, no, we can't do it. It's not possible with the kind of work that we do, which you know, I think we need to be a bit more visionary about this. Thank you. 
I'm just wondering, actually, because I had this had occurred to me whether this was um, a point to raise. It's a very good point for this um, um, strategy document and whether the, uh, this could actually be a recommendation, um, Richard, whether we could um, insert this, because I'm just realising now. I mean, I've got recommendations for the biodiversity, but we haven't um, so far um, established any, introduced any. Anyway, um, that's... Um, I think on the recommendations front so far, I think you've suggested things that Mish has written down that I will okay. note in the um, notes of the meeting as actions rather than formal recommendations. But great, um, great, thank you. In there. Okay, I think this would be a very useful one. Thank you, um, my Jarvis. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that point um, that. Council um, Miles was making about the larger cargo bikes that so we have facilitated some meetings with ODS and some manufacturers of very yeah large cargo bikes slash sort of mini vehicles um so it is it's something they are looking at but yeah I agree it's it's something that needs to be um sort of specific focus on I do definitely think they have a place Oh, well, that, that's that's great news that you've started um, a conversation around these, because I'm sure we're going to see more and more of these in, in small cities such as Oxford. And the more we can do to obviously um, get behind them, the better. Um, were there any other points um, people, councillors wanted to make about um, the decarbonisation? Otherwise, um, I think... Um, Rose can probably leave the meeting now, is that correct, Richard? And um, we'll move on to biodiversity. Yep. Great, thank you, Rose. <laughs> that was terrific, thanks so much. Um, great, so agenda item five then, jumping back, which is the development of a biodiversity strategy for Oxford, which is um, very exciting to have reached this stage. And um, again, it's a very um, comprehensive <clears throat> and I would say up to date um, strategy document, which really does paint a picture of where we are and what needs doing. And I think much of what's in here um, has already been set out um, in the um, <clears throat> introductory address we had from Dr. Gilling, which um, just does show that we're really on the same page about this. Um, I had a couple of points I wanted to make, but, but I just wondered if anyone else um, would like to comment or raise points. Uh, Catherine. Yeah, thank you. So um, really, uh, the first point um, is, you know, to what extent will we be framing this within um, the scope of the UK's commitments to the recently adopted, um, was it the Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework, so the GBF? Because I, I, I personally think that given that this sets out four goals by 2030 and I think it's 23 targets that we should be framing our strategy within in that framework um, and there are some very specific targets which I think are relevant to us as a local authority um, that need to be referenced and so rather than start the starting point of the strategy sort of redefining the problem the problem's already been def defined and we've got these frameworks so actually some of that's about translating it um, to the local context but then working within some of these existing frameworks that are there. So that's the, the first point. And I think particularly relevant from my understanding is um, reference uh, the uh, target um, 12, um, which is around access to nature as well, because I think that's something that comes up within the local plan um, that's uh, a draft at the moment. So I think that's uh, relevant and target one linking to spatial planning as well. Um, but yeah, there, there are also other targets, I think, that are particularly relevant. Like we talked about use of different forms of finance to su support the work that we want to do yeah, um, on the previous agenda items. And yeah, there is a target in that uh, global framework that re uh, refers to that. So again, we can draw on it. Um, the second point that I wanted to make, and I think which is really, um, yeah, I, I want to understand that we and, and have assurance that we're going to be framing the strategy in this way is um, the contribution of the, the city to um, the national target on species abundance as well, um, which I think is in national legislation. And so, you know, will we be um, framing 
it, this in that and if not can we make sure that we do um i have some some other points as well but um i think this is um yeah well done for yeah getting started i hope we get all the funding we need for it and it's it's very very important so um yeah i just hope that we can link it to all of these international targets that we as a country have committed to and therefore as a city we've got to contribute to those targets thank you yeah, thank you, Catherine. I think those are all very important points. And actually, yeah, the most recent um, conference on bio biodiversity, I keep getting that, um, struggling with that today. Um, yeah, it was, was only a few months ago, so it really has brought the issue into focus. Um, my... Um, yes, just wanted to say, I think that's there yeah, are some really helpful comments there about how it needs to be framed. And obviously our intention at this stage is that um, we set up a steering group with a wide range of members that can that can help set out specifically what this strategy needs to entail. I think that's why we're going down this route. We, you know, the city council alone can't develop a strategy for the city. We need all our partners to come together in that space. So that's why this is really important. We go about it this way. Um, and absolutely, you know, the city needs to contribute as much as it possibly can. And, and obviously the reason for that as well is that it, it benefits us. It benefits our residents, you know, um, hence why it's so important. Um, we have set out in the paper that something we've drawn out is that we need this sort of baseline understanding of where we're at as a city so we have something to measure against but then we also need to have some understanding of what we can contribute so in the past for example there's been commitments to things like you know increasing tree cover by 50 percent for example that might be appropriate in a county as a whole but obviously for a city that's very difficult especially in a city where we have um, a lot of habitats that are um, of very high value that are you know meadows and so on we wouldn't want to plant trees on those so it's definitely about finding out which areas we can contribute to the most um, and in the best way thank you i think that's very um relevant to um certainly what i think we need to focus on i just had a couple of points i might raise now um emily just because they sort of feed into um the two things i was going to raise. First of all, the baseline is, is essential. Um, the baseline in terms of defining what it is, I think really, you know, everything starts from there. And George Monbiot, who we all know, a big environmentalist who sadly now left Oxford, but he made the very important point um, that actually we're, you know, the, the, the problem we face is we have a shifting baseline at the moment because each gen for each generation, their loss is already normalised. So he's written, the people of each generation perceive the state of the ecosystems they encountered in their childhood as normal and natural. So when I go to the beach, where I, I, go to, I take my children to the beach in Devon, there's nothing in the rock pools. When I was a child, 40, 50 years ago, they were just full, full, full of the most, you know, crabs, sea anemones, you name it. So um, there's been this depletion over generations, and I think we need to really understand um, what the baseline is. So I think that's a very important point to raise. Um, and then also trees, but perhaps I'll come back to that um, after Emily, who's got her hand up. Cool, great, thank you. Um, yeah, so firstly, uh, look, the steering group, I echo the, the speaker at the beginning of the, the meeting, the public speaker, you know, the steering group sounds great. I think involving the university is a great idea, plus the, you know, the community groups, brilliant. Um, I really enjoyed the fact that glyphosate was included in this. So, you know, that was that was exciting. Thank you for, uh, for doing that. Um, my only kind of comment would just be that on, on designated sites, um, you know, the, the, the well, basically, it says that um, Natural England considers much of the land to be in favourable condition, which is true on an area basis because obviously Port Meadows in it. But if you kind of go to the the you know the SSI Natural England data display, there are quite a few that are in um, uh, unfavourable recovering condition, uh, and we don't say what we should be doing with them because um, it just says on point fourteen that the audit could be undertaken to understand how it could be retained. Um, I suppose achieved that means is that what you're sorry let to be clear the achieved means for the ones that are not in favorable condition that that's what the audit does so if maybe i'm maybe that's what that means in which case it's totally fine uh, i would just come in and say that obviously the process that they undertake is not 
basically it's not up to date right you know that there's load they haven't audited loads of the sites for like six seven eight nine years and as we've been discussing um sites deteriorate rapidly so i suppose if that in that point 14 an audit could be undertaken it does feel like we should also potentially be doing our own benchmarking to check that we agree with the designation because it's an old designation uh, and anyway some of them are in uh, unfavorably recovering condition so if maybe someone could just expand on that point thank you thank you no i think those are two very important points and i think yeah Again, this idea of actually trying to use all the knowledge in the room and that we've now got this opportunity to create a steering committee, steering group, um, which really does have to include the, the best of Oxford, because we do have these extraordinary sites like White and Woods, which um, are world renowned for biodiversity. There's a conference happening in May, I've just been told about on exactly this. Um, I mean, also just to make the point, which I don't think is completely um, explicit here that needs to be, which is that there is, uh, you know, we have to we have to define the difference between green spaces and places where we are nurturing biodiversity. You cannot have biodiversity in a green space. They're completely alien to each other. You cannot have biodiversity. And I've had many conversations over the last week um, with many experts on this. Um, in an area which is used for recreation and dogs. So that's why White and Woods explicitly says you have to book a time, you cannot bring a dog, you know, there's a reason for that. And this is something we really have to be conscious of and also feeds into why our meadows need to be protected. Um, so yeah, the, I think the two things um, are, are important that the steering committee and also making this very strong definition, um, explicit definition of what biodiversity actually means uh, for Oxford. Uh, Catherine. Yeah, I don't mean I wholeheartedly support the stakeholder engagement aspect, and I think that also aligns to these international, yeah, this international framework that we've, um, yeah, as a country, also agreed to. Um, in terms of some of the specific um, wording within uh, the document itself, um, I, I'm there were a few paragraphs and words where I thought that language could be stronger and I'm wondering whether this is something that you know it's our role here is scrutiny to say actually we would like to see a little bit more of a stronger stronger wording on some of these um these points um but uh so for instance you know the use of pesticides and glyphosate and the use of them well I mean I personally think that they're not appropriate to be used on council-owned land and and certainly there, there are many people in the city that might um, agree with that you know do we need to use stronger wording ar around that i think it was paragraph 11. um the other the other point um uh, around uh supporting organizations um in oxford promoting best practice and knowledge sharing you know, do we need to or should we suggest like uh, introducing these concepts of green walls and uh, walls and green roofs um, and and that, that in itself actually links up with some of the local plan discussions as well. Um, and then on the um, uh, sites of scientific in, interest, the, 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 there was sort of this audit um, uh, could, but actually shouldn't we be using stronger wording and say, well, we should be having this audit. It's not, you know, potentially we could audit. Uh, do we want to be making a recommendation that's stronger than that, saying that we need this audit, we need this baseline to be undertaken as well? Thank you. Yes, agreed. I think th those are very good points. Um, if I, okay, I and, just, sorry, Rob, sorry, sorry. Yes. Um, just to answer the um, question about um, is it appropriate to make these recommendations? Um, very much so, potentially. And I mean, in that, um, it, with regard to those recommendations in particular, you might, given that it's going to cabinet as cabinet report. Um, you might want to get Councillor Elton's view on whether she would be prepared to support such recommendations um, or whether she might like to work with you to reframe them or whether regardless of her position you would like it's fully the panel's right to recommend whatever they like. Um, Thank you Richard that was helpful. Should we talk about recommendations in a moment after we've just covered um, but I think we've definitely got a few here that we can um, start thinking about um sorry um lost my yes yeah, so just um on that um triple si point so the designated sites that yeah that what we had said out there was that you know we recognize exactly your point and natural england surveys are, are very out of date and hence you know 
um, it would benefit to have that updated. So that that is definitely recognised. Um, so that we really need that to have an appropriate baseline because we need to know what the what the status of those sites are. So yeah, I I agree on that. Um, and just on the um, point about green spaces, obviously the city council manages a lot of green spaces and um, the majority of those now um, are managed in some way or form for biodiversity. So we are doing a lot of work within our sites um, to increase biodiversity. So that's, you know, ensuring that we let things um, grow wilder, that we introduce a wider variety of biodiverse plants into our sites so that they, um, benefit invertebrates and so on so it's definitely something we're thinking about I do also take your point that there are certain species that doesn't go well with being disturbed and doesn't go well with for example dogs um obviously biodiversity is everything it's all tiny little earthworms um and they matter an awful lot and they don't actually care that there's people trampling along <laughs> across the so it's yeah just to make that point that I think our green spaces have a lot to contribute in terms of biodiversity. Thank you. I mean, I think the key word is also habitat, because actually what biodiversity allows for is safe habitats for plants and species um, and birds. And we know that actually birds, animals and plants get very stressed. Um, and that's why they have to have their own spaces. Um, Emily. Emily. Sorry, my hand Hello. should have been lowered. It, it was a miss. Oh, time. OK. OK. I mean, can we just talk about the glyphosate? Because I think that's a really big um, issue. And just reading about it today, I mean, certainly um, in France, for example, they've stopped using it and they burn the weeds. They've got those little sticks that burn the weeds. And again, going back to this issue of biodiversity, you cannot use chemicals in one area and not expect them to impact on, you know, <clears throat> the rest of the city. That's not how it works. And um, from what I've read today, there are at least, I don't know, I don't want to, I mean, it's a number that I just sort of came across, but there are a large number of councils, probably including Plymouth, that have completely stopped using chemicals. And I know this is something that councillor, um, um Nigel can't remember his last name um brought Jammer. up yes and um said we should be having this conversation and I think this is exactly where we should be having this conversation and I think this is certainly a recommendation that we take this back now to cabinet and ask them to look into alternatives because we want to become a chemical free city in order to um preserve and and encourage biodiversity I think that would be a recommendation uh, Mish Yes, if I, if I may, just and to talk to this um, specific point, um, so I, I have discussed this with uh, uh, Councillor Chapman, um, and he was clear that he wanted. I think all councillors here will recall the the debate that was last had in council chamber on this issue. I think it probably in response to one of the council questions, but uh, he he was clear that he does want uh, ODS and, and indeed colleagues in, in, in my team uh, on the sustainability team to have a proper uh, further look at this so I, I would I would perhaps resist the suggestion that that we should move straight away to saying glyphosate should be banned um, because uh, as I think everyone is, is aware we're using them at the moment and so they are part of the the tool being used by ODS but I think that this is appropriately um, looking now to properly review that, fundamentally review that and, and uh, the appropriateness of, of, of using glyphosates or, any, or uh, which are herbicides, in fact, or, or pesticides, uh, both, both of which uh, I think, uh, you know, we need to be, we need to be very thoughtful about uh, what the impacts will be uh, on the wider biodiversity. Yeah, I think, um, thanks for that. I think this is definitely a very good, um, place now to flag this up and to push it forward and see how far we can get with actually committing to becoming um, a, a council and a city that doesn't use it um, as, a, as a, a way to foster. Um, 
so did it, does anyone else want to raise something? I just did want to come back to trees um, because I know this is something that um, councils across the UK are struggling with. And I had a terrible, um, there was a tweet. Uh, anyway, there's, a, there's images today of, of um, outside Euston train station where the HS2 is supposedly um, docking coming in and they've just cut down X number of huge old plane trees, which is just extraordinary. Um, so again, it was just trying to raise the point that even though we obviously have um, targets in terms of planting, what we just have to have to do now is ensure that mature trees are not felled unless there is, you know, an absolutely urgent reason on the basis of um, health and safety or, um, well, really, help, you know, that the tree is, is beyond, um, has reached the end of its life. Um, and I think that this really is something that we need to now, um, like other councils, uh, recommend that every tree, TPOs are just not working. Developers seem to override TPOs. And again, this is uh, something that comes up a lot. Um, and my point is that um, we can't exist without mature trees. I mean, that's the bottom line. And <clears throat> given again, their habitats um, for, you know, animals and bugs and that we're the, the bird, um, as we know, we're seeing a huge decrease in birds now. Um, I just think that this is something we really need to focus on. So um, I think going into recommendations, I would really like to see uh, the protection of mature trees now prioritized. Um, and certainly one of the first things that happened when I joined the planning committee 18 months ago was the application for the Clive Booth campus buildings in um, Brooks which saw 81 trees and I went and visited the site, 81 trees, many of which were mature, were cut down. So again, it's this importance of getting developers now to work sympathetically with our existing mature trees um, and, you know, for there to be a kind of tree first policy around mature trees, um, I think would be really, really important and um, ensure that we're um, doing what we, what we say we're doing. Uh, Catherine? Yeah, I've recently been informed that there's such a thing as a swift brick that can be um, put in new buildings, which enables a sort of a swift, the type of bird to um, be able to nest um, in, uh, in in houses. And so I'm wondering whether you know, this is, might be gets to, to too much detail, but that is something that um, is worth looking at. But there were two other points just to, to make related to themes that we've talked about already, but actually also relate to um, uh, the, uh, the biodiversity strategy. So understand some of these global biodiversity targets also relate to plastic pollution and also food waste. And so um, actually um, we control or influence as we have, you know, we've been talking about um, with the street trading policy recently, yeah, um, some of the plastic pollution through things that we we license um, a, a, through the markets that um, we we own and control. Um, so, you know, to what extent are these themes um, going to be addressed in the strategy? And I think really as part of our recommendations, maybe we don't have to get into that level of detail, but you, you note that there are some some themes that um, come up in these this kind of global framework and our national targets that uh, may not automatically seem to be sitting in a biodiversity strategy, but are relevant for and, and need to be connected to um, the, the, the strategy that we develop as well, because they're under our control and influence as a city council, either as a licensing authority or as a owner of, um, a controller of some of these, these um, services. Thank you. No, thank you. I think that's very important and actually, um... Yes, getting some wording in there about um, reduction of plastics would, would be, I think, is critical. Um, Mai, if, um, did you have a point? Yeah, I just want to highlight that the council last year, the year before now, um, adopted an urban, urban forest strategy. Um, so to your point about, you know, how important mature trees are and how important it is that we maintain that cover across the city, um, that strategy was sort of highlighting that and highlighting how important our urban forest as a whole is. Um, I guess an important point around that as well is that we need to make sure that we plant new trees so that there's a continuous urban forest because obviously those mature trees will naturally die off. So it's equally important that we have a range of trees of all ages so that 
this forest that we have in the city continues to um, to thrive. Um, and just to comment on uh, swift bricks, because it's a, something we use a lot actually in our planning recommendations currently. Um, so we have a fabulous ecologist working um, at the city council who advises planning and swift bricks are one of the things that we will advise and condition um, where it's appropriate and I think that's the, the key thing I think there's some councils that have adopted that every house should have a swift brick um, we our, our officer recommendation on that is that that isn't appropriate we should look at specific sites understand what's appropriate for that area because we know there's some areas of the city that for example um, it would be better to install bat bricks because we, you know, they're they're next to the right habitat. So we're sort of using that approach now. So we have a more flexible approach. We recommend the intervention that is likely to be most successful and, and provide the best benefit. Thank you. I didn't know anything about swift bricks, but um obviously um fantastic to hear about. Um but again highlights why we do need um the mature trees because otherwise there's nothing to eat for these birds literally um so i mean i think um unless there are any other points to raise um perhaps we could just run through um where we are with um some recommendations um to wrap up tonight's meeting um uh, Richard, do you think, I mean, should we just focus now or should we just go through what we've um, extracted from the biodiversity um, plan? Yeah, um, I mean, yeah, you, that you could do that. I mean, I think before formulating recommendations, it's probably worth checking that um, Councillor Elton doesn't want to um, do her um, cabinet perspective on the report. Um, yes, sorry, Captain. Uh, Councillor Anna, did you want to um, come in now with um, anything to add to this fantastic um, um, overview we were, of where we're at? I guess uh, the one point I will um, raise is the fact that the biodiversity net gain, um, what's the word? Uh, thing with planning um, is being doubled from five to ten percent, I believe, from April, um, and this actually gives us quite a like. There's a real opportunity here for basically doing more of this. So you know, some sites you cannot physically achieve this, and uh, from November, thank you, um, uh, you cannot physically do it on site. Um, and it is, it would be better to do it. You know, first priority obviously on site. Second priority you know, within Oxford. And I think having this strategy is um, a brilliant opportunity to sort of pinpoint places where we can improve the biodiversity of, you know, of our sites within Oxford. Um, and you know, the, the next best thing is, you know, high quality sites within the county. But um, yeah, I think this is um, a real opportunity and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how this strategy develops. Yeah, agreed. I think, yeah, where we go from here is is really critical. Um, and perhaps again, um, after the recommendations, we can come back to um, how we're going to work going forward and if we can ensure that, um, you know, we're given scope now to really um, keep going on, on establishing these points. Um, Richard, I think we had at least um, three recommendations. Um, Right. So there was discussion as to whether about alternatives to chemicals um, yes. and whether you wanted Cabinet to give consideration to um, that review that um, Mish alluded to or whether you want to put something stronger. Um, so there was chemicals. Um, there was reduction of plastics. Um, protection of mature trees being prioritised. Um, and then Councillor Carr said something that my screen keeps missing. Where are we? Councillor Carr, can you remember what you said? Um, I've got it. I've got some notes. Hold on. Oh, it was just about um, the, uh, the FSI audit. versus... The, yeah, exactly, exactly. And there was the SSI audit doing it ourselves as well. Yes. 
I mean, why why hasn't there been an audit for so long? Do we know? Or has that just been the state of affairs up until now? And it's luckily... National England um, just have, you know, I guess they've got loads of work and not enough funding. And so some right. of the sites haven't been audited since 2016. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> My right. said exactly the same right. as me. Right, right, <laughs> right. OK, well, that's good to know. Rather like the Environment Agency. Um, OK, and I, I mean, I would like something about the baseline, but perhaps that's just... Um, to, to you know that's just a detail a specific to feed into the steering committee once that's set up I mean is there anything to add about the steering committee or is that just something that we can um keep aware you know an awareness of and perhaps feed into even um what what, what do you think Anna hang on I'm just looking at Catherine's thing in the chat about recommendations about stakeholders stakeholders right on the steering committee yeah if I may chair, I just wonder whether we yes. actually want to document that as a as a, a formal recommendation, given that um, yeah we've had an external speaker come to us on that, and and we've all kind of come to an agreement that we're I I I, I feel like there's consensus anyway that yeah that they're uh, having this diversity of stakeholders um, in the steering group is um, with these experts is is what we're we're saying. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I'd like a recommendation around that too. I don't know how we go about it. Um, My system but... is playing up, and oh. um, and it... so I can see you, but I can't get to the agenda. Um, but is the is the wide variety of stakeholders not mentioned explicitly in no, no, and it, it no in, in the cabinet report? No, well, so point have... seven. It may not be as wide as um, yeah, yeah. Wanted. It will include in, it, it will include representatives. Yeah. Well, this is yeah. It is it is expected that? Well, I think I mean I would struggle to think of what you could possibly add to that list. Yeah, yeah. But um, I mean, it's just a big ask. And how long is the steering group? Then you know how you know what what's the well, how, how's it going to work? I don't know. Maybe that's just something for later on for us to be aware of. But obviously, this is a critical. I mean, they're really the sort of um, the voice, aren't they, of of what's going to happen? So we want to have some input or engagement. Um, Catherine. Yeah, I mean, we were given as a recommendation from um, the external um, speaker of some particular stakeholder names that they thought might be appropriate. Wonder whether we want to put forward those the, the, the organisations as the, in a recommendation that this it is considered that these um, stakeholders um, are form part of um, the, the the steering group. And obviously, it's not our decision, but at least highlighting this co consideration of the, the stakeholders to um, to be considered. I mentioned it's like the university um, the names. Hero um, and the uh, Oxford University Biodiversity Network. Yeah, I think that's important. Yeah. That would be great. Um, yeah, I think those two are stakeholders um, to be included is. is um, and if I may um, wrap it up, yeah. Yeah, so the, um, the other um, point um, that came up also in the uh, feedback, uh, the, the presentation at the beginning uh, by the speaker was around uh, the uh, interlinkage of, of biodiversity in the local plan. So yeah. I wonder whether um, maybe Richard, based on the discussions we've had here today, because we've, I think, mentioned a couple of things that where there is a, a theme that is of relevance to the local plan, but also um, the topics that we've we've touched on in the agenda, including on biodiversity. And maybe if there's something that you could formulate into a recommendation related to that, that um, conveys this essence of we are, um, you know, we want to ensure that, uh, that the, 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 these huge commitments around biodiversity um, are sort of addressed within the local plan and, and that we accelerate our work in that area. I mean, where does biodiversity sit normally within a local plan? And should it actually now be given 
um, you know, a, a more established, um, you know, should it should it be prioritized in some way? My. Um, so yeah, um, biodiversity is one of the key areas of our local plants already, the, the one we currently have and the one that's been developed. So our team is heavily involved in developing policies for that. And biodiversity is definitely something that's a huge focus on um, what we're looking at now. And, and I think you've seen the um, um, the consultations been out on, on potential policy options. And some of those policy options are, um, uh, I think, really creative and going further than we ever have in how we can ensure that we maintain and, but importantly, enhance biodiversity in the city. So it's, it's definitely a key focus of the forthcoming local plan. Um, I mean, just one in, in, in terms of wording, I think something that comes up again and again is what's irreplaceable. And I think what we have to really establish is that you cannot, you know, in many ways, well, you cannot replace a, a mature tree, you cannot replace a, a meadow, an ancient meadow. And I think um, wording to, um, you know, ensure that we're aware of that is important. Um, Anna? So yeah, uh, when it yeah when it comes to the sort of planning points, um, not really sure it's possible to give a sort of like strict hierarchy of importance and stuff like this because I think it will depend. You know, the whole point of planning is it's very it's site specific and a lot of stuff depends on the individual circumstances of a site. So you know, there's there's a lot of things to balance here, and I think we need to not lose sight of that. So, um, I mean, I I and I think you know, can't commit to something that will mean that we, you know, for example, can never build another social house in this city ever again, because we've basically tied our hands. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's other things like that. There's other things like, you know, jobs and sustainable locations, um, reducing the carbon emissions of, you know, existing buildings and the, the carbon of future buildings as well. And I think, so I think, I'm not sure we can sort of you know, put it at the top. Um, I'm not sure that's appropriate to do so, but uh, I'm sort of rambling here. But I mean, yes, I think May has already spoken to the fact that it is already considered. Um, I'm not sure, personally sure how to word it. Word, well, I mean, yeah, this is your recommendation not mine. So, um, yeah. Um, Catherine, did you want to... Um... Yeah. Well, I think it's it, it just comes back to the these um, global frameworks so where you've got a spatial uh, planning framework. Our recommendation is that sort of the the link um, to uh, the UK's commitments um, under this global biodiversity framework and um, and targets related to spatial planning, so that these just are accounted for in the local plan. So I think it's it's about making sure those linkages and alignment is there. So the recommendation is. Um, for uh, the, to achieve alignment with you know, our, our global commitments um, uh, related to spatial planning and biodiversity in the local plan. Um, and so it doesn't get to the de details. The details are in these targets that we as a country have committed to already. Um, to the second uh, second point around recommendations, actually, what I do think is that we we should have this recommendation. Uh, the point I made earlier around this um, the, the strategy is developed within this framework uh, um, that has been ag agreed by, by us as a country as well with these targets and goals by 2030 uh, under the Global Biodiversity Framework. And then secondly, the recommendation that this strategy is also developed. Um, uh, in uh, with this um, target in mind to halt uh, or connected to this this um, national target to halt decline of species abundance as well. So we tie that our recommendation is that any future strategy that is being developed when it is developed ties to these two sort of targets and points. Thank you. Yeah, I think we've got to get decline of species in that. Um, I think that's critical and. Um... So are we are we clear on on trying to use a bit more of the language around frameworks and where we are um, internationally? Is that? Yeah, I mean, what I'll do is I'll um, pull together yeah. some wording tomorrow Thank and send you. it around. Thank you. Um, so that you can check Perfect. that it Perfect. covers what you want. Um, on baseline, Councillor Hunt, um, 
you said you wanted one about baseline. What about it? Just um, <clears throat> I think it's just an understanding that it is the most important concept defining our relationship to the natural world, the shifting baseline syndrome. So it's obviously, again, something that here in Oxford, we're so lucky, um, you know, we have experts that can advise on this, but I think we have to be very careful. You know, if you went to South Park and saw one, you know, sad tree, um, not that the trees in South Park are sad, but anyway, my point is that we have to be aware of, of where we're at today in terms of um, what's called the shifting baseline syndrome. Um, and on the audit of SSIs, is the yeah. panel recommending that yes. ca the council considers doing its own or pushes government to enable uh, uh, natural England to be able to do new ones? No, I, or I, what, is the, what is the panel recommending to cabinet? I would recommend that we, with using the expertise of our steering group, look to audit our sites of special um, interest ourselves um, as a matter of urgency. And again, I don't know. You know, it's this idea that we have to be holistic and joined up and you cannot have one area that's now properly maintained, white and woods and so on. You know, and, and actually going back to wording in some of the previous documents, it's about the green corridors and you cannot actually um, have these green corridors if you're not looking after um, the entirety of, of your um, natural environment. And on alternatives to chemicals, what's the panel recommending there? Is it that consideration is given to how we might move away from using chemicals? Yeah, in line with other councils across the UK. I mean, if that's of use, but it's certainly being, um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's 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 lots of local authorities that have stopped using. Yeah, so uh, what I'm just trying to um, work out is, so Mish talked about um, the fundamental review um, and sort of slow approach. Are you recommending that fundamental review be, be begun? Or are you saying we don't want any chemicals? Go. No. Is it the, the review into considering how you might move away from using them? Oh, I think we need to go in a bit stronger than that because actually it is possible and it's being done elsewhere. And actually we're very behind. It's a very you know old model to be just spewing chemicals. Um, so um, a review with a um, um, I uh, can't think of the language now, but um, more than a review, um, we actually want to. Um... The goal is there, sorry, isn't it? The, our goal is to to have yeah. that, to be that. So that's the aim. To agree, um, yeah, to approve. Next to achieve that. Yeah. Looking to approve the ban of chemical herbicides and glyphosates. Um, within the next, you know, yeah, as you know, as a matter of urgency, as a matter of course. Um, okay. Um, doo -doo. Looking through my bullet points to see. I mean, just as a note, the, the, you know, the Soil Association says it takes seven years for soil to rid itself of chemicals, which is why obviously you can't just, you know, piecemeal use it here and that not there. I mean, it affects every aspect of your ecosystem. So we've got trees being prioritized, alternatives to chemicals, audit of SSIs, baseline understanding the shifting baseline syndrome, um, stakeholders in to include HERO and the Oxford University Biodiversity Network, um, interlinkage of the relevance to the local plan and the commitments around the GBF and the government's targets. Um, and Councillor Hunt wants to emphasise um, that trees are irreplaceable. Um, Thank and I'll you. Fit that in. Um, <laughs> is that does that cover all of them? Yeah, I think that's fantastic. Councillor Miles, yeah. I've missed one of hers. 
Yeah, so the, one of the recommendations that wasn't on the biodiversity, I think, just to make sure it's there, yeah. was around the this cargo bike usage and fleet de decarbonisation of ODS, mm -hmm. just yeah. to make sure that we don't lose that point. I know it was logged, but um, just have that as a formal recommendation, please. Yep. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank I agree. You. That feels like progress. Um, then we've got, do we want monitoring the net zero master plan as a standing item? Have we yeah. agreed on that? So this is now moving on to the Sorry. Um, yes the, the work plan item yes. and obviously at the first meeting the first meeting your work plan is currently empty and it's a question of what you want on it um, and you might want to brainstorm now or not um, you can think of items you can ask Councillor Relton what her priorities are coming up that she, you might want to look at um, you could ask Mission Mai if they've got anything they think that you would want to look at um or you can think yourselves and the um given that unusually um there is an audience um i'd point out that members of the public can also request that items go on the scrutiny work plan and if you were to email democratic services at oxford.gov.uk um they could be fed into the consider panel's consideration and indeed the wider scrutiny committee itself Thank you. Um, I think, Anna, um, is there anything that you feel that we should now be? Uh, well, um, so I, I assume like... the EV strategy will be going to like full scrutiny. So I don't know. I To be honest, I don't really know how this works. Um, would it also come here? Like, I, when is it due? Like, yeah, that's the only one I could think of. Um, but yeah. In terms of whether it would go to full scrutiny or to the panel, um, if it's an item that is particularly within the remit of one of the standing panels, and that is meeting in a timely fashion before the cabinet, um, before the meeting of cabinet that will consider a strategy or whatever, then it will come here. So for, it could go to the relevant panel. So the biodiversity strategy is being considered um, at cabinet this month. The climate and environment panel is meeting before it um, with time to produce recommendations for it so it would go to the relevant panel and if there wasn't one meeting at that time it would go to the main committee okay um does that make sense do we want that to come here um given the date it seems it might be important Oh, you're excellent. You missed yourself halfway through. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> if, um, no, I'll, I, I was just going to say it, it sounds yeah. like date wise that it might not make sense if that's going to the main scrutiny anyway. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah, you know, I'd like to see it, but I assume it, does it get circulated? Is there any other way I can get sight of it? Um, you know, is there a way of circulating things to just this group, even though it's not part of a official meeting? I mean, clearly there is, but is that possible to do? I, I would like to see it. But if it's going to screen yeah. me, then it's going to screen me, and I know it'll be on the agenda. When is this strategy to be published? Sorry. The, uh, the EV implementation, EV infrastructure implementation plan we're talking about. Yes, it says by end, well, by Q1. So I was assuming it was going to be within the next three weeks. But I might be optimistic. No, Q1, sorry, means um, we're talking about the new financial year. Financial so that, that year. would be, year, okay, <laughs> be well, end of year. June. So 30th of June is what I take in, have in mind when I hear by Q1. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's that's the sort of time frame. Okay. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, we're, we're quite having... I think we're quite open minded to, to what we review and it would just be um, I think the key is to know when we're meeting again, actually, so that we've now got a sense of, um, how, you know, w when to start circulating um, and, and putting together an agenda. And I think meeting up to just really um, have a brainstorm on on what to start engaging with, because um, we've made some really good headway today. Um, that would be my um 
sense of of where we are rather right. than being being more yeah, specific. So, so set a meeting date first and then we can back off back up from that when we know when we're meeting you know what yeah therefore yeah. we need to do in that next meeting so yeah uh mish yes just so uh, and rose mentioned this in in respect to the the um the the, the master plan that uh, document so we've got an internal cycle of meetings with a quarterly uh, net zero carbon steering group. That's, that's an officer uh, uh, level group, but it but it does involve officers across the whole council and ODS as well, uh, and, and indeed uh, OX Place involved in that meeting. Um, that's going to consider that master plan and, up, and we're going to produce an update on a quarterly basis that will track through to the corporate management team. And we had envisaged that this uh, th th this scrutiny panel may wish to, uh, you know, to, to then kind of review that the progress. And so, um, from the, from the point of view, I, I suggested this to Richard previously that we 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 try and see if we can get sort of good alignment as as, as far as possible uh, with those dates. I mean, obviously, it's it's entirely in your gift to decide whether or not you want to look at the thing. But we'll what we'll try and do is ensure that it's it's always available and can be provided to you so that you can then. Uh, uh, perhaps interrogate any particular aspect of it that you you're you're interested in. You may want to, um, as I think um, Rose again said, if you want to drill down into one of these particular areas, and of course, as you've all seen, it's a very broad document. Then you may wish to to you know to you can then bring people in, specialists who are involved in whichever bit of uh, commercial property we talked about. At some point, it'll be the right thing to do to to drill down into that. Yeah. And in terms of those dates, um, I have them in front of me. Um, so the net zero um, officer steering group meetings have been scheduled for the 28th of April and the 24th of July. Um, and so a meeting after that would seem sensible to be able to look into it. Um, if you want a general brainstorming session, you may want that before the end of the municipal year. And you might like to invite um, Councillor Elton and Mish and I and Rose along to brainstorm with you. Um, it's really up to you. Um, I mean, I think we'd really appreciate, um, you know, being able to review the um, the net zero master plan. So, um, yeah, I think, again, it's when we're meeting, you know, when we're next planning to meet. Um, so that obviously work will have been done and we can then, you know, review and, and feed in and, and um, engage with it. Um, are we intending to have a meeting then um, what, before September? I don't know if, I, if we were. What was the general thinking on this? Before September, yes. Yes. Uh, and on the assumption the scrutiny committee re-establishes um, the panel, um, which no reason to assume it wouldn't. Um, then yes, you'll meet before September. So sometime between April and July, then, or do we want to meet before April? That you know, I so think can we have can we have a brainstorming meeting, perhaps? Um, yeah, Richard, what would the normal cycle be? You know, yeah. excuse me, I'm only a, I'm a fairly new councillor. Obviously, some meetings are kind of six monthly. Would this be two monthly? Would so six meetings a year? I'd, would there be four? How does it normally work? It's either four or five. As I said, my. <laughs> Um, the um, scoping document I can't get into because my system has decided to kick me off the network. Um, but it's either four or five meetings a year. Um, I think it's four. Um, Great. Yeah. So looking at that sort of... Um, I think May frequency. then. Can we go for May? Because then obviously there'll be... Um, the yep. It will have gone to the officers, won't it? The master plan. And then we can... Um, add comments and so on um, and review where we are and then decide on the bigger picture for our following meeting. Would that make sense? Great. Yeah, yep. great. Towards the end of May would be the... Yeah, yeah. let's right. do that. Sorry, Chair, could I just come in on um, that one? Sorry, my camera's not working um, at the minute because of my internet connection. Um, but obviously, if you had the meeting in May, that would potentially be subject to reappointments to panels because the scrutiny committee will kind of re-establish itself at the start of the new municipal year um, and appointments to panels could theoretically change so it might be that you want to have that meeting in April in this municipal year 
um, rather than in May, just for consideration. Yeah, I mean, Alice ties into what I was on the same wavelength here, which is useful. Okay. Um, so a, a brainstorming meeting this side of the municipal year, I would suggest, would be useful to set the agenda um, for the next um, panel, which may well have the same people on it. Um, who knows? But um, to have that, because if when you meet in April, can I just check with um, Mission uh, uh, my um so if the net zero steering group meeting is on the 28th of april does that mean that information will be available before then or after then just so i'm clear after so after. that it, it is effectively rat of we agree the the the, uh, yep. the update at that meeting so As i suggest officers. brainstorm in april work in may stroke june yeah, that, I agree with that. Let's not hang everything off the, the master plan and we do need to meet, um, I think, to continue this good work. So if we can aim for an April meeting, that would be that, you know, I think would make sense for everyone. Yep. Uh, so I will look at um, council meeting diaries and officer diaries and remember school holidays and uh, um, all, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then suggest circulate suggested dates and Councillor Miles is sending lots of suggestions for the work plan which is handy and five times per year we've got from alice which yeah. Yeah. is good news so thanks for that so what i'm going to do is squint at my screen whilst trying to screenshot it then add that into the notes so i will word up um word up is that an expression probably not <laughs> it is um i shall um Look at the recommendations wording uh, tomorrow and circulate that to you if you could confirm that you're happy with it. That'd be great. Um, and then I shall send it to Mish's team for response on the recommendations, who will then get it signed off by Councillor Welt, and, and then it, off it will go to Cabinet. Great. Um, and that will all be quite quick because Cabinet is on Wednesday, so I will try and get it done ASAP. Excellent. No, well, we like fast and swift. So thanks so much. And um, yeah, particularly to the officers and to everyone else who's put in.